This is Mr. White, and this video right here is on Sinusoids. Oh yeah. And you know how we've been doing lately. We've been doing things without a calculator, right? All right, I'm going I'm to stop talking like that before I frighten you any further than I may have already. But I am very excited because we are getting into sinusoids, one of my favorite topics of all time. Uh, this section in the book and this section of the course is all about taking the, the um, sines and cosines and tangents, etc., on the unit circle and turning them into those beautiful, lovely curves that we saw earlier in the year with our 12 basic functions. So let me introduce the topic here by saying, look at these little animations here, and I hope you see some things in common between them. These are a lot of real world phenomenon, and, and, and I would like to encourage you right now, right off the bat, when you're just walking around in real life, forget math class for a moment, when you're just walking around in real life and you see uh, something swinging back and forth, whether it's a child swinging on a playground or whether you see the grandfather clock in, uh, you know, in the corner of your parents' house, um, when you see the pendulum swinging back and forth, um, when you see a tree swaying in the breeze, I want you to think of sinusoids. The back and forth, back and forth motion that we see in many real world phenomena are uh, modeled mathematically by sinusoids, which go up and down, up and down in a smooth, harmonic fashion. Uh, when you see something in real life spinning, whether you're you see a Ferris wheel, or whether you see the gears of some mechanisms, or whether you're studying planetary motion in, um, in a science class. I want you to think sinusoids. Even though that's not the linear back and forth motion so much, um, when you think of how rotating angles around the unit circle, um, and how that relates to, to creating the sine wave, which is something that we'll spend more time developing in class, I want you to think sinusoids. Um, there are some, I, I like these two animations in the middle here the best because um, this little toy and this uh, motor here uh, exemplify how you can have both back and forth, back and forth linear motion and circular or rotary motion in the same contraption. We see in this, uh, in this motor how the, the rotors, the parts that are turning here, are mechanically linked to these pistons, which are going back and forth in a linear fashion. And you see mechanically how they're linked. Uh, on this toy over to the left here, you see how turning the handle in a circular motion causes those little gold sliders to go back and forth, back and forth in a linear motion. So it's all interrelated, and it's all about sinusoids mathematically. All right, so we're going to focus today on the mathematics of it. Later on, we'll start getting into linking it to the real world in, in more detail. But I flashed these on the screen, these uh, um, functions of um, these trig functions of angles on the unit circle. And you should be able to do those. That's, this is not the focus of the video. But um, if you were to pause this, you should be able to evaluate each of these by now. I'm going, and again, just in a very quick fashion that we'll elaborate further on in class, I want to remind you how the sine wave was born. Uh, it was born by considering all these angles, whether, we, whether I wrote them in degrees or whether I wrote them in, in, in radians, I want you to consider all these angles as x values, okay? Those are my x values, and the resulting sine and cosine values are y values. So think of those as x and y values of, of points on an xy plane. And on the next slide, you're going to see that the, the a, b, c, d, e, f, they are all um, correlate to the next slide, where if I were to plot those x and y values, I would get these points. On, um, and I drew them on two separate um, graphs, the sines on the, uh, up here on the top graph and the cosine values on the bottom graph. And if you were to graph not only those points, but the points, the x and y values, or the angles and, and, and trig functions of all the other cur uh, angles that exist on the unit plane, I'm sorry, on the unit circle, that would fill in the, the gaps there, and you would get your sine wave that we first saw back when we were studying 12 basic functions. If you do the same thing for cosine values for all the angles on the unit circle, um, you would get the cosine wave. 
So I feel like this is an exciting time because we, we saw these curves for the first time a long time ago. Now we should be really starting to understand where they came from. Um, one major theme that I, I started hitting on a long time ago was the reason why the period of this function, the time it takes to do one full cycle before it starts repeating itself, that's called a period. The reason why the period is 2 pi is, do you know why? Hopefully you're thinking because that's how many radians are in a full unit circle. And once you rotate around the unit circle, uh, um, uh, 2 pi radians, I'm going to just do a quick little sketch here. So if this is my, my unit circle, and if I'm going around the unit circle, 2 pi radians, I start repeating myself. Every 2 pi radians, I start repeating myself. That's why on um, the sine and cosine waves, they repeat themselves every 2 pi units. Okay. So that's a, a synopsis of what we, things I've introduced in the past, as well as things we'll continue to build upon. This is a major thing that you need to know where these curves come from. All right, so here's the official definition of a sinusoid. A, a sinusoid is any function that can be written in this form. And when you look at these, um, I want you to start digging up memories of the transformations we did earlier, the, the vertical and horizontal translations, and the vertical and horizontal stretches and shrinks, and the reflections, and all that great stuff. Um, and with that in mind, I'm actually going to introduce a form that I like better, this alternate form that I prefer, and I will tend to use it in class. Um, let me get them both visible here. Um, they're fairly similar, but just slightly different. And if I put some actual examples up here, the difference between those two forms is that one of them is factored and the other isn't. In other words, if I have 3x plus 6 inside the sine function here, if I were to factor out the 3, I would get 3 quantity x plus 2, right? Well, we have to ask the question now, which one of those reflects the horizontal translation better? Thinking back to, to translations, <clears throat> you would ask the question, does that plus 6 counterintuitively suggest a horizontal translation six units to the left? Or does the plus two represent two units to the left? Remember, they're the same function, so the answer can't be both. It's got to be one or the other. Is, did this function get move six to the left or two to the left? Well, it turns out the answer is two to the left, and that is why I prefer this factored form is because the plus six could be deceptive. It makes you think it's, it moved six when it really shifted uh, two. So that's why I like this, this alternate form, and I will strongly suggest you stick to it yourself. But other than that, this should all look familiar. You should be able to, just to tell me exactly what that 5 does. <clears throat> what does that 3 do? What does the plus 2 do? We discussed that. What does the plus 8 do? Start, re pause the video and, and, and go back to your notes or the book and review that if you have to. It's coming back, and I told you it would. All right, oh, one last thing. I'm going to explain real quickly. They, they seem to be implying that, uh, uh, or, or the question could arise, what if this were a cosine? Is that still considered a sinusoid? The answer is yes, but I'm going to wait till, till class time to, to really explain why. And I'd, I'd certainly encourage you to think if you can, see if you can figure out why before I even, even tell you. All right, so at this point in the book, there's a, 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 some new terminology. Don't be afraid of it. I'm not going to um, really get into it too much in this video, but I certainly wouldn't object if you want to open up the book and see if you can start figuring it out yourself. I'm not going to insist on it, but it's not a bad idea either. Um, eventually, you will need to know uh, and be comfortable with these terms amplitude, period, and frequency. The only one I'm really going to use in this video is, is period. I've been using that you know, rather casually without even officially defining it um, so far anyway. The um, thing you need to know about the period, <clears throat> for the sake of this video, is that a period, again, as I said earlier, is how long it takes for a function to start repeating itself. And not all functions repeat themselves, but if a function repeats itself, what is that distance? And I've said that that is 2 pi because that's a full trip around the unit circle, right? Well, the thing I need you to recognize is that that period is 2 pi no matter where I start from. So, so whether I start at the origin and wait till I end up at a point that's back at that same point on the curve or, or a similar point on the curve, whether I start there or whether I um, move a little bit to the right and start at the top of a mountain. 
I could start at the top of the mountain, go down the hill into the valley, come back up to the top, and the next time I'm at the top of another mountain, guess what? That distance is still 2 pi. Hopefully you're saying, yeah, I know, that's pretty obvious, Mr. White, but, but really realize it doesn't matter where you start, that distance is always going to be 2 pi, no matter where you start, okay? Um, formulas for what the period is, you're going to see those in the book, form, other formulas. Again, I'm going to insist that we don't really need to get into that at this point for, for this video. In fact, I'd really kind of rather stay away from them. Um, here are some instructions that, that I'm going to loosely follow for the sake of this example, but I wanted to show you the instructions from the textbook. You're going to be asked um, in your assignment to find the amplitude, the period, and the frequency. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of ignore that for this video. Um, we'll, we'll tackle that in class, or, or you could tackle it on your own if you want to um, before class. Uh, but we're basically being asked to draw this uh, function by hand. And I absolutely insist you should not be picking up your calculator now. Do it later if you want to check your work, but you should be drawing these by hand without a calculator. And um, this, this example says to draw it uh, in the window negative 3 pi to, to 3 pi and from negative 4 to 4. I'm going to kind of ignore that. So again, I'm not going to formally follow this, uh, but, but hopefully you can take what I do and, and um, and follow up more closely on your assignment. My main focus for this video is to get you to see how do we just jump in and start this, because a lot of students have trouble with this. So <clears throat> um, I'll get rid of the instructions here and just focus on this. And before you start drawing, let's discuss those, um, those transformations, OK? Uh, I'm going to say there are three transformations here. And I'm going to go a little bit quickly, but again, you should be digging back to your old content and saying, yeah, I got that. Three transformations. Um, first of all, there is a reflection across the x-axis. Um, the 6 represents a vertical um, stretch by 6. And the 3 fourths, uh, you need to remember counterintuitive, right? So 3 fourths feels like it's shrinking, but it's actually also a stretch in the horizontal direction by counterintuitively not three-fourths, but four-thirds. All right, pause the video, I insist, and, and refresh your memory on that if necessary. I told you that stuff would be making a comeback, and here it is, coming back. All right, so you need to thoroughly understand that those are the reflections, or those are transformations that this function has undergone from the basic function. And I'm going to um, encourage you to, to uh, work on graph paper. Uh, here and if you have your own graph paper, awesome. If you don't, I should have some in the in the classroom that you may use. And while some teachers may fault what I'm about to do here, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stand by my decision here. I'm gonna say uh, let's let's just worry about drawing a decent wave and, and not worry about the scale right off the bat. Again, we, we may want to um, you know. We may want to refine our skills a little bit later on, but I find students so often have a hard time just drawing the curve. I want you to just focus on drawing a decent curve first, and then we'll worry about the scale, okay? So if you're inclined to draw a curve that looks kind of like this, um, not my best work, but if you draw a curve that looks like that, I need you to ask yourself, is that the sine wave or the cosine wave, the basic sine wave or the cosine wave? And you should recall that the one that goes through the origin is the sine wave. Um, so I don't want to draw that. I want to draw the cosine wave, which tends to start high. And, and I'm not worrying too much about whether I start and make the height, you know, make it a height of 1 or make it a height of 2. I'm just going to rather arbitrarily say I'm going to call that, uh, I'm going to start 2 units high. And I'm going to draw a cosine wave that's going to go through this point. It's going to then go through this point. And, and so I highly encourage you to, to just draw some points and then draw between them. Now, I've seen so many students in the past just connect the dots, and that should look, hopefully that looks faulty to you. You need to kind of start off going over and then down, and this is going to take a little practice. Every year, students need to, to work on drawing this, but I'm going to say that is one decent um, cycle or one decent period of a cosine wave. Uh, it started high at the top of a mountain, and then it ended at the top of a mountain. That is one period. 
Now, before I draw any more, let's now start focusing on the scale. And I'm going to invite you to approach it this way as you're starting out also. Um, we need to remember that originally, what did we say this period was? We said it was originally 2 pi, right? Well, don't, for, don't forget, it has been horizontally stretched by 4 thirds. So the period, I'm going to say, is not 2 pi anymore. The period is going to be 2 pi times that, that stretch factor of 4 thirds. And that's going to give me 8 pi over 3, OK? So I take the original period, the basic period, and I have horizontally stretched it by 4 thirds. That's what gives me the new period of 8 pi over 3. So I'm going to write the period equals 8 pi over 3. And now I'm going to label on my picture the scale. I, I, I should never draw a graph without a scale. So that is a scale. That point right there represents 8 pi over 3. Okay. I'm going to draw another cycle. And again, just kind of plotting points here. Um, the same way I did before, I draw another cycle, and I say that, not my best work, but again, not bad. That is another one, and that is going to be at, I'm running out of room here, but I'm going to say that is at 16 pi. That's a little messy. I hope you make that out. That's 16 pi over 3. I could do one to the left. Um, you know, I'm going to call that my last one. Again, I'm not strictly following the rules in the homework for this example. So I have just drawn three full periods, and this would be negative 8 pi over 3. And one thing we're going to do in the future is we're going to say, OK, from here, how could I identify the coordinates of the extrema, the minima and the maxima? And hopefully you can look at that and say, you know what, I think I know how to do that already without you telling me, Mr. White. OK, so um, that represents the, the horizontal scale due to our horizontal stretch. Um, remember, this has been vertically stretched by 6. So whereas the basic sine function goes up 1 and down negative 1, this thing has been stretched by 6. But don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to erase that and redraw it stretched by 6. Hey, we're, we're making this drawing right, so we get to make the scale. I'm going to say, you know what? I meant all along for that to be 6 and this to be negative 6. Problem solved. Isn't that convenient, right? Obviously, if you were given a grid that was already had the scale determined, you'd have to give a little more forethought. But again, I'm choosing right now to just let you determine the scale after you focus on drawing a decent wave. OK, uh, the last thing I need to pay attention to is what about this reflection across the x-axis? And unfortunately, if you draw this on paper and then you note the reflection, you are going to have to redraw it. Um, so. Not really any way we could fix that with scaling. Uh, I'm going to draw it in a different color here. I'm going to just look at each point that I have here, and I'm going to reflect it across the x-axis. And then I'm going to draw a new curve through it. And that will be my last transformation that I need. Um, this is a deep topic. This is a tough one. So if you're struggling to understand, if you're just barely hanging on, I really need you to, to pause, to rewind, to um, to replay as necessary, and certainly to come to office hours um, as necessary to get this stuff. You don't want to procrastinate on this um, and let this become a, a, a headache, okay? So there is my reflected curve. I'm going to erase the, um, the old stuff. What you might want to do is just draw the preliminary old stuff, you know, draw it real lightly, and then when you know you got a good curve, draw it more heavily. That might be another way to approach it. But I'm going to call this example done. I'm going to say, there is my picture. Again, I'm going to encourage you to use graph paper. I'm going to, uh, um, uh, and I'll supply it to you if need be. Um, the period, as we discussed, is 8 pi over 3. You're going to see a formula. But notice we didn't need a formula. We just used our knowledge of transformations, OK? So you try it now. You know the drill. Pause the video. In just a moment, I'll show the, uh, the, the solution curve. All right, uh, here is my curve. And notice that this one, due to the 2x counterintuitively was a horizontal shrink, right? So instead of a period of 2 pi, this thing does a complete, complete cycle in 1 pi units. And if you missed any of that, if any of that didn't make sense, you know what to do. Come see me.